Today's interview is all about investing overseas with liveandinvestoverseas.com editor-in-chief Leif Simon. At Live and Invest, Leif is the resident real estate investing and offshore diversification expert, and he's also the editor of Offshore Living Letter. Leif has purchased more than 50 properties investing in 26 different countries around the world. He has more experience buying and profiting from real estate around the world than any other individual investor you'd likely to find. For me, as an avid traveler, I've lived on four and a half continents. I count the Middle East as half a continent. And traveling to 80 plus countries, I love all of the live and invest overseas.com content. We could have talked for hours. This is something I'm very interested in. But with this conversation, we tried to stay on topic with the due diligence required before purchasing a property. So what are you looking at? What kind of countries? What different factors should you be thinking about before? or investing in these countries, then the pitfalls to avoid once you do make these investments. So thinking about transfer tax, which can be up to 10%, thinking about the total round trip costs, sometimes some countries, the real estate agent fees are up to 10%. Then you, the, the additional things like uh, rental income tax, capital gains, these are all tricky things. And we talk about how to think through these and what to look for before entering a new market. Then we talked about other options of different ways to invest in real estate overseas. So things like hard money loans. In a place like Panama, you're looking at 23% for a two-year lockup, so about a 1% per month. And this is hard money with a reputable lender. Um, Um, or something like agriculture investments throughout Central America. Before you listen, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the podcast. If you like the content, I would also really love a review on Apple Podcasts. All of these things really help people to discover the podcast and keep this content coming. After this interview, I'm really ready to take the plunge. So this is something I tiptoed around with for a number of years. But in this interview, we talk about FX rates, all the other things that you need to keep in mind. And I really think at this point, I'm actually ready to take the plunge. So come on Beach House, here I come. Please enjoy this conversation with Leif Simon on all things investing overseas. Leif, I'm uh, really excited to have this conversation. I've been a a reader of liveandinvestoverseas.com for quite some time now. Uh, Excited to have you on and share your knowledge. So welcome to the show, Leif. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we chatted a bit about this before, but you know, my my audience is looking for investments outside of the publicly traded uh, markets. So, with Live and Invest Overseas, you guys produce a ton of good content about purchasing a home overseas, renting it out, getting some rental yields, all of these things. So, I'm really excited to dive into all of these topics. You have a ton of great content, blueprints, uh, guidelines on how to do this. Do it strategically and uh, with an, your investor hat on. But right. I'd, I'd like to start today. I mean, now you over 50 properties uh, in 26 different countries. How did you get your start in investing in international real estate? Oh, uh, yeah. That, well, that, that was just uh, serendipitous, I guess. But I always liked real estate and always had this idea of living overseas. And when uh, Kathy and I met, um, it was on, we were on a tour in Ireland together and I was thinking of moving to Ireland. Um, of all things, I was going to open up a pub. And if you n- knew me better, you would laugh at that because I'm not a huge people person. I couldn't stand behind a bar and talk to people in a pub. So that was, that was not a good idea. Um, but she was moving a business over to Ireland. And, uh, so I moved with her, I actually was going to do a project there and, um, it, it didn't work out a real estate project. And so just started helping her with that business, which was the same genre of what we're doing at, at Live and Invest Overseas, and started looking at, at real estate. So um, my first purchase overseas was in Ireland, the house that we lived in. Um, but my first investment was in Spain on a pre-construction deal that uh, I talk about at, at our events, um, because it's the only time it's happened for me and the only time I think it, I, anybody's ever told me their stories about buying pre-construction that it went perfectly textbook. So, um, it, you know, bought at the right time as the developer launched, the developer sold the property for me, um, two months before completion. So I didn't have to come up with the rest of the money and everything in between worked out very smoothly. 
Um, and so from there, we it just kept you know, buying more real estate as I was doing more research in different com- countries. Nice. And the, as an investor, that's always very dangerous, right? For your first big investment to go perfectly. Right, right. <laughs> you you kind of walk too, around with this. This is the way it's supposed to happen for the, forever. Yeah. Like I, I, I pick these winners all the time. You started in Ireland. Uh, then your first investment was in Spain. What are the other kind of countries you're investing in? Well, right now, um, well, we just, we serendipically, serendipically is a word, sir, the, uh, we bought a property in Portugal in 2015 on our first trip there, which was more or less the bottom of, of the Portugal market as it was recovering after 2008. We sold it last year. Um, at, it had more than doubled in value in four years. And then COVID hit. And so we, I think that Portugal is going to be a place to look again, not, not now, according to my contacts, but maybe um, early next year, all mortgages and um, and rent payments are um, on hold until next March. And at that point is when our contacts think that, that, that people will be forced to, to sell um, and prices might uh, get softer than they are now. So um, that is one place I'm looking, Portugal. Um, Brazil, Panama is always on our list in various ways. A big part when people ask me you know, where to invest overseas today, the first question they guys is, well, what do you want to invest in? What fits in your portfolio? Um, so I talk about agriculture to our readers. Um, short-term rentals right now are probably not going to get you any yield since the airplanes are shut down, but uh, something to, to always look at and be prepared right now, looking at markets that are going to recover more quickly from tourism uh, than others. There's some perennial markets that are always uh, always good. I think, you know, um, the Playa del Carmen market in Mexico, it's always going to uh, be relatively strong because it gets Mexican and U.S. Uh, tourism. So you don't, you're not always relying on just the Americans, which can be a dangerous thing if uh, the U.S. economy uh, has a hiccup or something happens. So there's, there's, there's plenty of options. It's just what is, what is it you're looking for to fit in your portfolio? Are you looking for cash flow? Are you looking for long-term um, income for your retirement? Are you looking for uh, a combination of appreciation and uh, current cash flow? Those kinds of things. Yeah, and that that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm big fan. I I speak Portuguese. I lived lived in Brazil and uh, Portugal, so I, I I actually went down the rabbit hole of looking at properties in Portugal. So very good intel. March 2021. I'll uh, I'll start putting that on my my <laughs> calendar to think about it because I know they were a little heated, but they're still. Um, much lower than a lot of other places. So the first step in purchasing real estate overseas is it sounds like the why. So I love this country. I want to spend my summers there every year uh, to this is a great investment. And this is the primary reason. Walk me through the process that you encourage people to take when they when, you know, I have I have money saved. I know that I want to make this investment overseas. Walk me through uh, the process that somebody should start thinking about. Yeah. So for me, I'm more about the numbers. Um, but if you want to think about it on on a scale of pure personal use and pure investment, and where are you going to fall on that range? If it's more about being a second home and you just be happy with whatever. Uh, income you can generate when you're not there, then you're you're farther over here. If you're really, you know, I, I don't care what the property looks like, I'll stay there when I'm there, but I want a good return. Then you're they're farther over this direction. Um, and uh, my wife Kathy would say, buy a place that you are comfortable being in and where you would like to be, because then if the investment side falls apart, you, you're never able to rent it at all for some reason. Um, you own a property that you're happy to use for, for yourself. And we'll probably like to be able to more easily sell as well because it's a it's a property that someone else will like. So that's that part of the process from a, from a numbers perspective. Um, and one also you want to be you want to be interested in going to the place so that you you can you're happy to go to manage your property and check up on it. There, are, you know, I'm sure you can find great real estate opportunities in uh, Mongolia. You could years ago there were high yields and things like that. But you're not going to go check up on your on your property. So it's either got to be pure investment and find somebody there to turnkey manage it for you um, or look somewhere else. So that's why 
Um, a lot of Americans, when they first look to buy overseas, that you know, they, Mexico is next door, Central America is easy to get to, um, so they start there, and properties are cheaper. So it, you, know, you used to be able to find a lot of properties for under fifty thousand dollars in uh, in places like Belize and Panama and elsewhere, but uh, now your threshold for something that's decent, you'd be lucky if you uh, find something under a hundred thousand dollars, and that's part of the process as well. What's your budget? Um, because you're not likely to get financing uh, overseas. Most countries you're not going to get financing. The countries that you may get financing might not be worth the time and effort to to deal with it. Um, so you start with your budget and where you like to spend time and see what's what's there. Um, from my perspective as a real estate investor, looked in, looking in you know dozens and dozens of markets over the years, including the U.S., you can find a great deal anywhere, great investment anywhere if you spend enough time. Um, but where do you want to spend that time? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think, and Kathleen had said, you know, what kind of window do you want to wake up to? What kind of uh, view do you want? Right. And that, that kind of stuck in my right. head of, oh yeah, that's right. Do I want mountains? Do I want desert? Do I want beach or, or whatever? Uh, an interesting thing is I, I just went down to Baja, Mexico, not too long ago, and there's gigantic billboards along the the main highway there that say El Nuevo Sueño Americano, which is the new American dream, <laughs> own an apartment in Mexico, right? So they're just cashing in on this uh, way cheaper than the US, uh, al although it's, you know, at a, a multiple of what it was 10, 15 years ago. Sure. So I, I think for my listeners, it, it, definitely for me, it, it, I'm somewhere in between. Think about financials and everything I do, so I can't just ignore <laughs> ignore that aspect. But like you said, I mean, I, I don't want to buy a coastal beachfront property in Somalia because it's not a place that I want to go visit two times a year for the next right. 30 years. Kind of finding that sweet spot of this is a place that I I, I love, like something like Colombia. Um, you know, the people are really nice. The government is semi stable, uh, but it still has that potential for a high yield, good investment, both in appreciation and rental yields. Walking through the whole process, how do you start looking for international properties? Do you say, I love Colombia because it ticks this box. Well, now let's go make sure the numbers check out. Where do you find this information? What what is a walk me through brand new person. I want I have cash. I don't care about the financing. Right. Let's go buy an international property. What do I need to do? And yeah, so the first thing is educate yourself um, and 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 pick and pick a market to focus on. And I've been doing this so long that I mean a lot of my thought process is just is automated. But when I when I go into a country a new country um, where that I that where I've never been, um, so we can go back to my first experience in in Colombia. Um, which was uh, about 10 years ago. And we bought a property there within 12 months of our first visit, I think. Um, but we went to Medellin. That was recommended to us by uh, some of our friends and a couple of readers as the place in Colombia. So we went there and fell in love with it. It's perfect, beautiful. Been to other places since in Colombia that just don't match up to Medellin from our perspective. Um, and, and started just walking neighborhoods, which gets you some looks as a, you know, six foot two white guy walking around in Colombia. They didn't understand why, and Kathy's tall as well, but didn't understand why we were there. But just to get a feel for the place and the neighborhoods and see, you know, from a safety perspective, do we feel safe from uh, amenities and stores and things like that? Where are they? How's the city laid out? And so we spent a day or two doing that. Then we contacted a couple of real estate agents, and I speak Spanish well enough to I got one Spanish speaking uh, agent. But for our readers, we always try and find, um, you know, of course, English speaking uh, people, agents, and attorneys, and things like that. Um, and started looking at some properties on that first trip just to get a feel for the market. And that's one phrase I use for readers, which is um, be in the market. So don't just do internet research, go to the market, look around, see what the prices are on the ground. Um, because typically, if you're finding something on the internet that's uh, in English, that's the worst price. Um, if, assuming that the local country's language isn't isn't English. In Belize, um, they speak English. What you're finding on the internet may be a, a decent price. Um, but if the real estate agent um, speaks English and is advertising on the internet, you're getting 
if nothing else, properties that are higher priced because and they may the value may be there, but they're higher priced because uh, the assumption is that uh, foreigners have more money to spend. Um, if you so you can find a fifty thousand dollar apartment, I think in, in Medellin, maybe not in the high end neighborhoods that we talk about, but certainly if that was your goal, um, you could achieve that. Um, so find a real estate agent. Speaking the local language helps. Then the next step is to find a, a real estate attorney. Um, I'm always asking for referrals and got one in Medellin within the first week and met with him before we left on that first trip. And I think we made two or three more trips um, before we got serious and, and did our, our normal search for a property and bought something that we ended up renovating um, in that case. But that gets back to lifestyle versus investment. I found a, a property that would have been just pure investment. It was not a place that Kathy would ever spend a night in. I might not have even really wanted to ever spend a night in, but it was going to make cash flow. Um, she wanted a place that she would spend time in. So we bought an apartment that was needed a complete gut renovation, which is the best kind of renovation to buy. And we renovated it to a level that we've only rented the place out in eight years or nine years, however long we've had it for two months. Um, because the, the first people who rented it like to cook, they scratched my nice wood countertop. And like, no more, no more renters. I'm not going to have damage to the property. Um, so that one is a pure capital appreciation play. Plus we use it when we're in, we're in Medellin and I should sell it and put the money into something that's cash flowing. But um, I just like the property too much. So this is the danger of, of buying something that you uh, have emotional ties to that you're wanting to be an investment as well. Um, and so that, that's how we I enter a new market first, get a feel for it. So that I, so when people start telling me things about neighborhoods and stuff, I can make a reference and see if they're telling me the truth or exaggerating or whatever, and whether I want to work with them or not, and then just keep asking for the next referral, the next referral, and um, decide who to work with from there. So, I, I mean, what the most common mistake you see when somebody determines, okay, I want to buy something in Colombia, I want to buy something in Medellin, is not going there, walking around, talking to people. Is that one of the most common things, or that's just me? With my lazy tax thinking I can find everything <laughs> online. Um, I th yeah, I think it, I, I highly recommend um, visiting a place and visiting a property before you buy it. Of course, I bought properties, actually own properties that I've never seen. Um, so, it, you know, I, I, I make rules for myself. And then if I'm going to break the rule, I break it knowingly and do more alternative due diligence, if you will. So if you're not going to go to the place, then do you have friends who might go to the place or someone there locally who can uh, at least look at the property for you, those kinds of things. But uh, definitely boots on the ground, to use an overused phrase, um, is, is always good. And if you speak the local language, internet research is, uh, can be much more telling than, again, doing the research in English. So when I go to look for current property prices in Medellin just to talk to our readers and uh, update things. Um, I'll do a search in Spanish and see what prices uh, I can find. Um, searching more like a local, which is going to get you more to the local pricing. Makes sense. Well, good. No, so I have a built-in excuse to go visit all these fun countries that I want to visit anyways for the rest of right. my life, right? Perfect. Um, and then in terms of like research with, uh, so every country has different laws, uh, title, property rights, taxes, all of these sorts of things. What is, uh, what are the red flags, no go, no matter what the cap rates look like or the investment perspectives of, um, of like governmental landmines that you try to uh, avoid? And they could be real landmines if you're in a place like Laos or <laughs> Cambodia, <Right>. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, there's still some areas in, in Eastern Croatia, I think, that uh, would be no-go for landmines as, as well. Um, it's crazy. <laughs> it's true. The, the, the countries we talk about don't have um, many, if any, uh, property restrictions. It's usually like Mexico. You can't own within 50 kilometers of the coast unless you own through a Fide Camiso. Um, but still many Americans think that you can't own property at all, period, in Mexico. But outside of that 50 kilometers of coastline or 100 kilometers of a land border, you can own freehold title in your name in Mexico. Um, other countries have similar, like Nicaragua is 
five to 15 kilometers of, uh, of the land borders, Panama, it's 10 kilometers land borders. Most of the time, those are places you're not going to be looking for property. Uh, anyway, South America has some restrictions on agriculture land. Um, Brazil uh, is probably the, the worst offender there. Um, Argentina as well. But again, most people aren't going to be going to buy, buy uh, agriculture land um, in, uh, in most countries. So from that perspective, you know, foreign ownership is, is fairly straightforward. Croatia, you have to have reciprocity. Um, your country has to have reciprocity with Croatia. So uh, that's one hiccup we found when we bought in Croatia was that they actually wanted a letter from the last state we lived in, uh, in the U.S., which for me was Illinois, staying, saying that Croatians can own property in Illinois. Well, you're not going to get a letter from the <laughs> Secretary of State of Illinois stating that. Uh, unfortunately, at the same time we were buying that property, we uh, were in the process of getting our Irish citizenship. So we just switch the contract to our Irish passport once we had it and titled it that way. But there are always uh, other options like owning through a corporation. Specifically of what properties not to buy, um, in Mexico, it's Ejido land is what it's called. And this is where, you know, when you see on the internet people saying, oh, no, I know a friend who had his land stolen by the Mexican government. Well, it wasn't stolen. He never actually had proper title to it. And he was taken by the developer who sold it to him. Um, That's his problem for not doing due diligence and hiring a proper uh, real estate attorney. Um, In the U S you don't usually use a real estate attorney uh, for most transactions, unless you're doing a commercial transaction Um, overseas. We highly recommend it. You don't need it necessarily in all countries, but um, we highly recommend it. It's the real estate attorney who's going to do the title search. Now in the U S there's so many safety nets. If you're getting a mortgage, you know, the bank is going to, Hire the title company. The title company is going to do the search. The systems are very well laid out. Other countries, uh, not so much. They need an experienced uh, real estate attorney uh, to do that search for you. So you're not buying a Hito land in Mexico or Cooperativo land in Nicaragua that may have have uh, title issues that uh, that the real estate agent isn't going to necessarily tell you about because they just want to sell you the property. Yeah, the biggest risks then to investing. I mean, a lot of people think that uh, the government taking my land, but it sounds like a lot of that is uh, is is avoided if you have a good real estate attorney that does the right. title search correctly, and you find those people from uh, referrals. You know, but it, it, if you show up in the country, I mean, talking to a real estate agent, he's he, like you said, he's just trying to, or she, uh, just sell the land, right? Well, it's, it's, and, and in Central America, frankly, it's the gringo real estate agents, the ones from North America, that are usually the ones to, to watch out for most. Um, we knew one in Nicaragua years ago that would tell us, why do you keep telling people to check the title? That's just that just slows down sales. Like, oh, right, my okay. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't, we didn't deal with him very long. Um, but, yeah, it, th- they're, they're, and, and there's... The other side of things is that there's not licensing required to be a real estate agent in most countries, in fact. Oh, um, and That's so good. so the guy you're dealing with uh, may not know anything about real estate at all, probably, especially if it's a gringo real estate agent, may not know anything about real estate in the country he's selling it. And at a conference years ago, I was up front explaining this to people and said, you know, the person may have been a travel agent in Florida three months ago and moved to Roatan in Honduras and started selling real estate. And I saw out of the corner of my eye, somebody get out and storm out, the, storm out the back. They made a big bus loud enough to hear from the front of the room. Um, and when I got off stage, the conference manager came up and said, well, you've got, you've got to go apologize. Apologize to who? I didn't offend anybody on stage. How could I have done that? I'm used to offending people, but not while I'm giving a presentation usually. And she told me about, the, well, so-and-so from such and such real estate agency from, from Roatan. Well, it turns out he literally was a travel agent three months before and had moved to Roatan, started selling real estate. He had no idea about real estate, period, let alone uh, Roatan. And so how can he advise someone for buying property in Roatan, what the, you know, what the things are to look for in title, how a contract should be put together, and that kind of stuff. So you want to... There, there are good gringo real estate agents um, in uh, Central America. We work with uh, with several, but you want to make sure you're working with someone who has experience. And if they're new to the country, at least they have experience in real estate, so they understand, you know, how to look at things and how to, you know, analyze pricing and things like that. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, so an, another big risk in my mind is that you're, well, obviously you're investing in this other country, you're investing in their economy, you're investing in their currency, in the longevity of this nation state. I mean, how do you think about, so I, I choose Colombia, I choose Medellin, I find my real estate attorney, I'm, I'm walking around, but then, you know, I'm a Colombian peso, is it? But um, so I'm, I'm exposed to the Colombian economy, the Colombian peso, it's driven a lot by tourism, I would imagine. So COVID has this negative impact. So, I mean, how do you, how do you think through uh, FX risks and things like this when investing in other countries as well? Right. So, right. So Colombian peso has actually um, devalued since the COVID thing uh, a good deal. It's recovered a little bit. And in fact, since we bought in 2010, it's gone from call it 1800 to call it now, I think 3,800. So it lost more than half of half of its value. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. My property is still worth about double what I paid for it because local appreciation has been so strong um, because of the local economy and the growing middle class there. So sometimes, you know, currency risk is, is never predictable. Um, so, sometimes it can go in your favor, sometimes not. So I focus on, that's another reason to, to buy in places where you want to spend time. In fact, one thing we, we talk about with our readers is, so if you want to spend time in Colombia and be there part-time, especially when you rent out your place, um, you can earn Colombian pesos. In fact, a lot of rentals rent in dollars in Colombia, but uh, just stick with the imagery, renting Colombian pesos. And then when you're down there, you're spending Colombian pesos. So you don't have to worry about exchanging your, your lifestyle dollars. Um, you can spend your pesos, whether the peso is up or down or sideways. Um, we do that with the euro in Europe as well for our, you know, our European uh, cash flow properties. That money just goes into a euro bank account and we can use it uh, for cost of living when we're spending time in Paris. So that's one way to think about the, the currency um, risk is to mitigate it by, um, by wanting to spend time there and spend uh, the money there. On the capital side, it's... You know, it could be a bigger risk if you wanted to sell and then move that money back into dollars to, you know, to buy something else. Um, but long term, real, you know, real estate's long term investment, long term currencies are impossible to protect. So you just got to be comfortable um, with that risk and be open to the idea of just of doing it for diversification, um, which is a, which is a big part of why we do it. The the other risks, you know, country risk is is relatively low. Your governments aren't going to take your property unless, you know, unless you bought big swaths of agricultural land in Venezuela 20 years ago, then you might have been at risk. Um, eminent domain, of course, is possible in the U S so it's, it's, uh, people ignore the risks that they're, they, they're already comfortable with. Um, and we talk about safety, you know, people feel safe in environments where that they're familiar with. Um, so, you know, somebody living in South Chicago may actually feel safe, even though it's one of the least safe places in the world right now. Um, but they might go to, you know, the safest neighborhood of Paris and not feel safe just because they don't know their way around. So a lot of that is just, um, in your head, as far as uh, I'm concerned for most people. Um, then the market risks are the ones to really pay attention to. So you talked about, uh, tourism in Colombia and right, right now, the short-term rental market is zero across the world. Um, so where are the tourists coming from? That's one thing to take a look at. I mentioned Puerto Vallarta earlier, not Puerto Vallarta, sorry, the other side, Playa del Carmen, um, where they get a lot of Mexican tourists and U.S. and Canadian tourists. So over the years, that market has evolved to being totally reliant on the U.S. to the growing middle-class Mexicans taking vacation there. Uh, and so you've got two markets now that you're uh, less concerned about market risk, whereas the rentals in Spain are mostly Brits and Northern Europeans. And if they stop coming, then that you, know, you saw what Spain, what happened to Spain in 2008, 2009, and there's still some markets that are recovering from that. So did I cover all the types of risks that you asked about? And I'm kind of yeah, no, I, I mean, down. that makes sense, right? If if we knew how to manage FX risks, we'd just be making millions and billions of dollars in the FX markets alone, right? right? It's pretty, but I, I was curious more like, uh, you know, major factors that you're looking at before going into a country. So a big part, 
are you willing to spend time there? I, I love the, the just conceptualizing, okay, I'm earning rentals in pesos. It's going into my peso bank account. I'll spend it when I'm there because I love the place anyways. That that really um, resonates well with me. But thinking, you know, am I looking at GDP growth, population, job growth, mineral and water rights or, or availability, uh, tourism uh, sources, where that's coming from, what percentage that's making up of the GDP? What What key factors are you looking at here? So for, for the properties that I look at for short-term rental, um, what I would look at is where are the, where are the tourists coming from? So is there a local tourist market or a foreign tourist market or both, preferably both? Um, and then where are those tourists going? And is, is it in a market that I will be able to, what, what's the resaleability ease? And what's the liquidity? The real estate's not highly liquid to begin with, but an apartment in a good neighborhood in Medellin is more liquid than a farm two hours outside of Medellin, for example. Uh, and the, you know, the farm may have good agricultural income, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to sell it quickly if you need to sell it. And then that gets to one of the biggest things we've been paying attention to on that side of real estate um, the last few years is the, is the growing local middle class. So Colombia has it, Brazil has it, Panama has it. In fact, um, Panama had you know, a big boom with Americans going down there after the canal was turned over. Then they had a, um, a, a follow-on boom from Venezuelans and Argentinians and Colombians buying property there. And when all that kind of settled out after 2008, the local developers were able to start selling to the Panamanians, beach houses uh, to Panamanians because the growing middle class and there's still a, a uh, a deficit of local housing, which we work with some guys who do hard money loans down there. So there's different ways to get into markets. You know, short-term rentals is one. Um, agriculture is another. Uh, these kind of hard money, local hard money loan uh, offerings is yet another. So you know, part of what you're going to analyze is what part of the market are you uh, planning on investing in? So you you have an ep- excellent episode number 24 on your podcast, um, Live and Invest Overseas podcast. That's all about your due diligence checklist. But one from there, you know, is how do, how do you think about taxes? So rental income, cap gains, and then additional uh, transfer costs and things like this, with which vary wildly from country. Right. I mean, you just model this into whatever your investment you're making. Yeah, you you got to you got to run some math and right. The the biggest thing people are surprised by when buying overseas are the are the transfer uh, taxes. So not every country has them, but most have some sort of transfer tax. And I've just updated, in fact, some of the data sheets um, that are on the website for the for the new book. Um, how are the transfer taxes calculated uh, as well? But transfer taxes can range between one and ten percent. And that affects your budget. So if you've got $100,000 and transfer tax are 10%, you're not buying a $100,000 property. You're buying a you know a $91,000 property or whatever. So you want to factor that into your your, your buying upfront budget. Um, you want to look at the total round trip costs when you're buying. Um, real estate agent fees can be high in some countries, um, as high as 10%. And again, you to use Roton and also uh, for certain types of properties in Belize. Uh, they can be low in, in Colombia. It's three percent. So you want to understand that's sort of thing. The, the Colombia is probably the uh, lowest total round trip uh, costs uh, for a country that I can think of off the top of my head. And then the there's rental income tax. How is that? If you're assuming you're renting, how is that assessed? Um, some countries like Portugal, the rental manager is obliged by law to withhold twenty five percent of your gross rental income after the rental management fees. And so that's how it works for us. For Americans, um, you're going to report that income on your U.S. tax return, but you'll get a tax credit for that 25% withholding. Um, So you're going to pay taxes somewhere as an American. Um, It's just a matter of who gets to keep the money and what kind of credits you get on your tax return. Capital gains taxes are another tricky one in country by country. Some countries have low capital gains tax. And the other thing is with taxes, the rules are always changing. So when we first started going to Columbia, their capital gains tax was 33%, which bothered me at the time, but I thought it couldn't stay 33% if they want foreign investors. And sure enough, about four years later, they switched to 10%. 
Uh, so right now, that's the capital against tax uh, in Colombia. Other countries have a, a slowly disappearing capital gains tax on real estate. France is uh, the one I know best since we have property there. Oh, and one France has two taxes on capital gains. One is the actual tax, and one is social charges. French love their social charges. Um, the tax disappears after uh, 22 years, and the social charges disappears after 30 years. Um, and it starts declining after the first five years of ownership. So that's more information on tax you probably wanted in your head right now. But no, uh, I mean, these but, are significant numbers, right? I you, mean, you've got to look at it yeah, country by country. And again, remembering that as Americans, even if you're not living in the U.S., you're going to be paying, you know, reporting that income and paying tax to Uncle Sam if you're not paying it to someone else. So if you're paying 10 percent in Colombia and you're in the 20 percent bracket in the U.S., you'll pay another 10 percent to the U.S when you sell that property in Colombia. Yeah, and I've, I've had a whole nother episode just all about the foreign earned income exclusion, FEIE and flag right. theory. So this is, I mean, with diminishing returns going forward, uh, taxes, transfer costs, all, all, all of these additional fees and things really eat into, into your, your net return. So it's something you have to be aware of. The one other thing I was thinking on there is uh, property taxes. Are they very wildly, obviously? Um, yeah. And there been, and most countries, they're going to be much cheaper than they are in the U.S. And I found out um, where I am right now in Northern Illinois at my mother's house. It's the real estate agent told me it's either the second or third most expensive property tax county in the U.S. because <laughs> I saw her property tax bill and nearly had a heart attack. Um, she pays more in property tax for her not highly valued house here in Illinois, I think, than I do for both of my properties combined in Paris. So that gives That's you an insane. idea. But, you know, yeah. Paris, French leather social charges, but on the property tax side, it works out to um, less than half a percent of the value. And that's the other thing with property taxes. How is property how are property taxes calculated? In many countries, it's on what's called a catastral value, and the catastral value is going to be much lower than the real value, the market value. Um, in Belize, for example, you know the the property taxes there are you, you can you can pay with a change in your pocket in some cases, and you know so when people buy property in Belize, I recommend go down and pay you know fifty years of property taxes in advance. Because the gas to go drive and pay it in person, which you have to do, um, is is going to cost you more than your one year's worth of property taxes. So it can be tens of dollars. And Panama is probably the, the most relevant in the middle example. Um, they recently changed their property tax rules, and it works out to more or less about one percent of the uh, of the sales value. Okay, and then other other big risks would be uh, understanding zoning rights. So, in one of your episodes, you talked about, you know, they just put a, a meat market next door because they can, and it's, right. or, or a nightclub right next door, which significantly changes the the deal that you thought you were getting into. So, I would think zoning zoning rules are something very important to think through. Is this something? The real estate agent can help uh, with, or or where do you go they, for the information? They 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 should really. It's your real estate attorney. You could ask um, those questions, and it's. I mean, we use it as an extreme example, and that example is from Ecuador. It actually happened. The nightclub thing happened to a, a friend of ours. Um, it's going to be the more third world countries that are going to have these these lack of these lack of zoning things. But also, if you're buying in a gated community, uh, what are the HOA rules? Or are there HOA rules? And we know um, a project in Panama, for example, that in fact there was an HOA, but they didn't have any restrictions on what you could build. And so literally there was a glass house with a colonial Spanish style house with a, in the next lot over was a teepee. I think the teepee was purple. Um, that has an effect on property values. So you want to, you know, if you're buying in an HOA, you definitely want to look at those rules um, and understand those for the city rules for zoning. Your attorney should be able to help you with that. And you want to ask, what can anything in my neighborhood be turned into commercial property that might devalue the, the, the property value? Yeah. And with HOA, I mean, it almost sounds like it would be an advantage to be in a neighborhood that has an HOA. It's an additional cost, but it protects you from 
you know, that TP next door sort of thing, right? <laughs> right. Well, the HOA also um, provides services. So, you know, in, in Belize, you're paying, we'll call it $10 a year on, in property taxes. And what do you get for your $10? You know, about $2 worth of services. So, the, you know, the roads are often in disrepair and, you know, other issues with just the general infrastructure in Belize. If you're in a gated community, that HOA fee is going towards maintaining that internal roads, at least, and keeping up, you know, with the landscaping and, and all those things. So a lot of people look at HOA fees as just an expense. I look at it as just a, an additional property tax that is going to help you uh, maintain your property values. Okay, so we've we've talked through a lot of the risks and the gotchas and the potential pitfalls. Are there any other ones that we're missing here that are screaming at you? Uh, screaming at me, no. And it's going to be the the, the the it's going to be country by country or location by location. Um, one one thing is if you're buying if you are buying for short term rental, make sure you can rent short term. And there are city uh, ordinances. You know, Panama City, the hotel groups in Panama City and in Colombia um, got the laws changed so that in Panama you can't rent within the city limits. Uh, short term for less than 45 days because the hotel occupancy rates were going down because they were building too many hotels. Um, so that's one thing to to pay attention. Columbia is it's less than 30 days. Um, in Paris, the apartment that we still have um, that we that we live in when we're there, um, when we moved to Panama, our plan was to just rent it short term, and we did that for the first year until our Cindy, which is the local HOA, you know, the HOA for the, the building, um, send us a lovely letter. You know, the French are always very polite in letters uh, saying, please stop renting short term uh, because it's not allowed. It's in the Cindy rules specifically that it's not allowed. Well, we didn't know that and it was easy enough to switch to long term. That worked out better for us anyway, as it turns out. Um, and we still snuck in a few periods of short term uh, anyway. But uh but you check the building rules, check the HOA rules to see if you're going to be able to rent uh, short term without any problems. I mean, if you want to fight with the administration, you can go for it, but it's easier to then just buy in a different building that will allow you to rent short term. Yeah. And the important thing there is these things are constantly changing, right? I mean, you buy in this particular area because it's allowed and it, the, that door can slam shut as quickly as you thought it was open, right? Yeah. And, well, and, Air, and Airbnb has changed a lot of rules in a lot of places as well. Um, in some cases for the good, in some cases for the bad. I think Airbnb is probably the main reason that our uh, rental yield in uh, in Portugal went down each year for the years that we own, own the property. Um, and that's why we sold in the end, because the value had more than doubled and the rental yield on the original Price had gone from eight percent to five percent. Five percent net is still decent, but not on the new value. So, you know, the Airbnb is a double-edged sword from 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 my perspective. But in places where they're the forcing the government to crack down on people who are not licensed to rent, for example, um, that's a good thing. The governments have, have had to you know, step up the game. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, Airbnb is is drastically changing rentals throughout cities, all of this stuff. And Portugal is a perfect example, right? I mean, the minimum wage is like 800 euros per month and the average uh, rent in uh, downtown Lisbon is over a thousand. And then the short-term rental is like 2,000. You know, like, right. How do, I mean, how right. do how these numbers make the any long -term, sense? Yeah, the long-term inventory, yeah. I also had a, a, another uh, person, Matt Bowles, on the podcast talking about single family rentals in the U.S. and uh, the tax advantages the, from an investor standpoint. Real estate is the most tax advantaged asset class in the U.S. I mean, you can write off all of these things against your income, and it's very, very uh, advantageous for investors. And some of these uh, more prominent U.S. investors, this is their argument against investing overseas. You, you don't get these tax advantages. You can't access credit, so you're not getting the leverage. You also you can't do a HELOC probably and unlock the the house value value probably right. not. So, what other what other disadvantages along these lines do you see with international real estate investing? Well, the main one is lack of financing. Um, bank financing is available in a few countries, handful of countries. And as a non-resident foreigner, 
you're not going to get remotely the same terms you would get in the U.S. Even if you can get uh, financing, it's going to be good looking at 80% loan to value at best, but probably you know 60 to 70% loan to value. And you're going to have to get life insurance. Most countries, most banks in most countries require a local life insurance policy, so that's an added expense. And right, refinancing to pull cash out is you know, painful. I've actually tried it in France and then laugh at me outright, but basically said they weren't interested in 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 doing that. Um, but from the tax advantages, other than the lack of financing, which then you're not able to write off the interest you're not paying, um, the depreciation is slightly different. You depreciate over 40 years instead of 27 for a foreign property, um, but you can still write off the depreciation. You can write off all of your expenses, and you can write off that those two trips a year you're going to check on your property. So you know, you're know you going to fly down to Columbia and spend a week there meeting with your uh, rental manager and, and checking your property and making sure there's no repairs that need to be done. That's an expense towards that property because that's why you're going down there. Um, the fact that you spent a couple of days you know, at the beach on the way back uh, aside. So there, there's that advantage of writing off some of your travel expenses. We know a lady years ago who um, bought two pieces of land next to each other in Ireland. She built two houses. One was hers. She didn't rent it out. The other one she had as a full-time rental, and she took trips to Ireland um, regularly to go check on her rentals, stayed in her own house, um, met with her renters, and dealt with that. But then she was able to write off those those airfares anyway to uh, to go check on her Irish properties. So other than the lack of financing and, and again, not deducting the interest you're not paying, um, the, you, you can everything else you can write off the same as you would write off in the U.S. Or for U.S. property. Okay, makes a lot of sense. So now that we've got a good understanding on how to identify a market, due diligence that you need to take, I'm curious: are there any tools out there? I'm I'm imagining this wonderful screener that's <laughs> sortable by GDP growth and tourism and all of these sorts of things. Is this something you guys offer through your website or you know of? We, we we don't, um, and it would be impossible to keep up to date. There is a website. <laughs> um, there's a website that tries to do some of that, um, and it's I'll, I'll give it to you. It's, they're not really competition for us. I don't think they're, it's globalpropertyguide.com, and they my we've known about them, and we actually knew the original owners. I don't know if it's been sold out or not. But this was you know, 18 years ago or something. And so there's a lot of data there. My problem with their data is they, it's data pr- provided by statistics from the country. They talk in terms of gross rental yield um, in these countries and for and look at long-term rental yields. Um, normally, short-term rental yields are going to be higher, and I don't usually recommend renting long-term unfurnished in a country that you're not living in yourself, that you can pay attention to who's renting and you know because the tenant laws are just too strong in most countries. Um, and so... It's a good place to get some basic knowledge, that website, but uh, and there's economic data and, and they have the transaction costs. Sometimes it, things change too quickly. It's not always up to date. So use it as a starting point, not as a definitive source, um, but it, it can get you some of that, I think, the, the, the GDP type of stuff that you're looking for. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll check it out and I'll report back. But thanks for that. <laughs> sure. So on, on that topic, uh, you you have a couple good articles on your website. So one is how and where COVID nineteen is creating real estate opportunity. So in in my mind, I mean, tourism numbers across the world are down. Currencies are devaluing at different rates. So something like Colombia. Um, how do you? Th- like walk me through what 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 opportunities are you seeing? Something like Portugal in March 2021. I mean, this is a property. This is a, a location that I'm comfortable buying in and holding for a long time. Uh, so if I could swoop in and get a deal in March of next year, you know, this is a great opportunity. But what other markets are you looking at? Should I be looking at? I'd, I'd love to get any intel you have there. So. And fortunately, it's markets we were already interested in to begin with. They just became some of them became better deals. So Colombia was one, and I think well the peso has come back a little bit already. Um, but Colombia and Brazil really took a hit when you know oil went negative in February or February or March, whenever oil went negative, um, because they're both oil exporting countries and commodity exporting countries. And so in a crisis like this, 
their currencies are hit. Um, the Brazilian real went from about four to one to five and a half or so. And so the developers we're working with there um, were priced in dollars because it was easier for people to, you know, North Americans to understand that and uh, not deal with the currency exchange. But they're, they've been offering discounts because the real has been so uh, been so weak on so on a lot of the new stuff that they've uh, they've put out there. Will the real go back to 4.0 or better? Again, hard to predict uh, currencies, but I've been going to Brazil for what about 20 years now. Um, 2002, I think, was the first trip I made there, and at that point, it was about 3.6 to one. It appreciated to about. 10 years ago to one and a half to one, and now it's at five and a half. So does it have the possibility to go, you know, the other direction past four, um, closer to one and a half? It just depends on a lot of global factors, but I would I would expect the real to appreciate. So there's some currency appreciation potential, but the rental yields um, are tremendous potential in Brazil because there's a lot of local tourism. In fact, the majority of tourism is local. Um, with some growing international tourism in the Fortaleza area, which is where we focus on because of new flights. Um, but you're looking at double-digit net yields in reals, um, but still double-digit uh, net yields on, on properties there. And because it's local tourism is the bulk of it, um, it's, it'll recover faster than some places that are solely dependent on uh, international tourism. I love Brazil, right? I, I That was my first expat assignment, and I just loved it. I love the culture. I love everything. I, a, a lot of things about it, but it has a number of things that are kind of backwards. Um, it, one of those things I thought was real estate, and I looked into this a decade ago, but I, I seem to remember thinking there was something very peculiar and different about the real estate in Brazil. Yeah, not that, not that I'm aware of other than this agricultural restriction, um, which is... is Turns out to be a problem for a, for an investment of mine. I actually did invest in some in agriculture in uh, Brazil, so attorneys are working through that. But um, but owning property outright in your own name is okay. Brazil's biggest problem, and you were there, so you witnessed it firsthand, is just bureaucracy. I think every year in the ease of doing business rankings um, that whichever global institute does those, it's for, for a major country, it's really horrible. It's like 186 out of 200 countries um, for ease of doing business. So the bureaucracy is painful. Um, there's been lots of information out there about the currency restrictions. So if you, you know, people say, well, I bought property in Brazil, moved my money down there, and then I couldn't get my money out. Well, it's probably because they skipped a step when they bought, which was registering the transfer when they sent the money into Brazil. Um, you have to register it with the central bank. And um, if, you didn't, if you don't do that, then getting the money out is going to be more problematic, especially getting the money out um, and not paying more taxes than you should because they don't see where the original capital, the basis uh, came from. So don't follow the rules and you'll have problems. Follow the rules and uh, it's more painful up front, but less painful on the back end is more or less how it works. Find a good real estate attorney and a good agent and uh, mm -hmm. go down there and figure it out. That's a right. good, good information. Um, an, another, so I'm, I'm loving the, where, where this conversation is going, all the good intel on, on investing overseas. Another two things you had mentioned were a way to get exposure to international real estate of hard money lending mm -hmm. and agriculture, turnkey agriculture, investing, or something like that. Can you touch briefly on that without going too, too deep on what you mean there? Sure. So hard, you might, hard money lending, um, fairly straightforward. And the one group we're working with in, in Panama, they're doing, um, you know, basically taking in $50,000 from an investor for a specific lot where they're going to build a house. And this is um, local housing. So, you know, low to medium income uh, housing in Panama, which there's a huge shortage of. And the reason that a developer will want to do this is because banks are paying in the keister. Um, don't know if I can swear on a podcast or not. <laughs> but um, it's for the children, Leaf. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the uh, you know, banks are, are bureaucratic and for construction loan, you've got to do all this documentation and then maybe it'll, they'll send you, you know, release the funds 
in a timely manner or not. And so um, it's faster and ultimately cheaper because of the you know, time value of money and, and speeding things along for developers to do it the way that, that they're doing it here um, and bringing in, you know, a trickle of money every month by you know, investors doing this hard money loan stuff. And it's a two year uh, fixed return the way this, this particular one's operating. I did one personally years ago in Australia, I met a, you know, Australian guy who was working with this developer and it was, it was a similar thing. In that case, it was 18 months and they were paying 1% a month. Uh, in the case of Panama, it's 24 months and 23%. So it's kind of typical for a kind of a international hard money loan kind of thing. I did them in the U.S. as well, and they worked really well. In the U.S., usually the hard money loan borrowers are the um, are the renovation re- renovation yeah. and flip guys, and that worked really well for me. I was making my whatever it was, 12, 14 percent, um, right up until 2008, when all those guys went out of business, as did the the manager for the hard money loan uh, business that I was invested in. So um, there, there is risk, obviously, on that side. On the agriculture side, you know, you know when wait, you buy wait, before estate, we go into the agriculture. Right, right, right. So, so, so hard money lending, though, should be relatively secured by that property, right? So if you have like a 50% loan to value, even if there's a gigantic correction in the market, you still have, have some cushion. Is that right. how, how does it work? Like what kind of loan to values? And for my listeners, so the way that hard money works is it's collateralized by the property. And right. um, like you said, I mean, these guys just instead of going to the banks and dealing with all of that, they'll, they'll get it, they'll pay a premium, they'll pay a higher percentage, but then they can start developing, they can start flipping this um, and their return should cover this additional cost of capital, uh, but they get it deployed more quickly. So how, how does it work in a place like Panama? I mean, loan to values and things like that. So in, in, in Panama, the the houses that are being constructed, so if the, land, the initially the lot is the is the value, um, is the collateral. Um, the houses that are being constructed are being sold on the uh, retail market for, I think, under 120,000. So between 100 and 120,000, because 120 is the, the threshold for the the interest rate benefits that the, the buyers can get from the government, the incentives from the government for you know reduced mortgages, um, and so once it's constructed, there there's your loan you know your loan to value is like forty percent, but of course when it's just a lot, your loan to value is probably you know a hundred percent, and so it's you, you've got to have some faith in the developer. Um, when we first started with this person, this group, they the, you know, the development was just starting, so infrastructure wasn't in yet, so there was more risk then. Now, three years, three and a half years later, um, they've already paid out first people who invested, and a lot of them reinvested. Um, so there's a track record, um, but still there's you know, there's risk if they aren't able to to build, but they've, they've shown that they are able to build. There, there was a big group like this that in Brazil that was churning out thousands of houses and just grew way too big, and it, it, it I don't think it started out this way, but effectively turned into a Ponzi scheme. This was maybe 15 years ago. Um, it has it written all over it, right, with these things. <laughs> yeah, and and this this guy out of the UK was the one running it and whatnot. In Panama, these guys are local developers, 40 year history, one project. You know, they're gonna they're they eventually are gonna build hundreds of homes, but phase one is 80 homes. So it's not it's not a beyond scope. Kind of uh, kind of scenario as it was in Brazil, um, but you still have to have some faith, and that's the due diligence that we do. I mean, especially since our office is based in Panama, um, we have the local contacts to you know do the due diligence on the developer and ask around. Panama is you know is a small town; everybody knows everybody. So some of the more important people that we know directly can give us feedback when we're when we're uh, asking about uh, you know a different family in Panama. Yeah, good, good stuff. Okay, thanks for that. And so then sure. the next one was uh, agriculture, turnkey agriculture investment, right? Right. And so yeah, agriculture. It, as I turned to that after two thousand and eight, trying to get just back to basics. I never left basics, but the whole rest of the world uh, did. They were buying for capital appreciation rather than yield, and rental yields were, you know. Good ones weren't easy to find in 2008, 2009 because prices had been bid up so much. You had to wait until they came back down. So I started looking at agriculture. The problem with agriculture is you either have to 
you know, buy a half million dollar property and hire a farm manager or a million dollar property or whatever. Um, or you have to buy shares of a company. And if you own shares of a company, you own shares of a company. It's like investing in the stock market, even though they're doing agriculture and real estate. Um, so it was hard to find developers who were focused on doing a, a project to bring in the small, uh, the small investor. And so over the last you know, 15 years, we found a few. Some of them haven't worked out. Some of them have. And we're working with, with about, uh, I guess, three really right now that have uh, four or five different products. Uh, available where you you as an individual can get in at like a fifty thousand dollar point. Um, there are other groups out there um, doing international, but also in the U.S. that I've seen uh, doing the agriculture stuff. But again, it's, it's shares, so you can you know you can buy a share of a cattle farm in Colombia if you want, um, but then you, you have no actual asset in your name. Um, whereas the groups that we work with, you you own something, whether it's land or uh, a greenhouse that's growing hydroponics or something like that. Cool. And my listeners can find out more about those opportunities through your website. Yeah. Yeah. They go to uh, liveandinvestoverseas.com and there should be a tab at the top for uh, for real estate and lots more information on real estate in general there. Well, Leif, uh, we're buttoning up against the time. I could talk to you about this stuff for hours, I know. But um, <laughs> you guys are producing a lot of content. You're clearly a subject matter expert on this. Um, so I'm sure my listeners are really going to enjoy it. Where where do you want where do you want to send them? Where can they find out about you uh, or, or your companies? Um, so the, the main website is the best place to start, uh, liveandinvestoverseas.com. We have Several free e-letters. There's a daily that's more about lifestyle that uh, Kathy puts out. I do a twice weekly offshore one, which is more about um, offshore topics like you're talking taxes, foreign earned income exclusion, but second residency, citizenship, banking, that kind of thing. Um, we have a once a week real estate one called the Overseas Property Alert, um, written by one of our colleagues in Ireland. Um, so for the real estate people, that's the one that, uh, that they should look for on the website. And um, so just for a pure blatant promo pitch, you talked about the new book. Buying Real Estate Overseas came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can buy it on Amazon and uh, has definitely a lot more information and detail in there, including a whole chapter on stories of properties that we've bought, uh, good and bad. Um, you know, not every, not every investment pays off. Uh, so we talk about some of the losers in, in the book in detail. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Ben. There you have it. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate your support. Show notes, transcript, links, and more can be found on our website at altassetallocation.com. If you'd be so kind, please share this with anyone you think might be interested or get some value from this conversation. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out. I'm always happy to hear them. Lastly, if you're on YouTube, please like the video or subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to the audio version of this, please subscribe to the podcast and or leave a review. This really helps more people find the podcast and I really appreciate it. Thanks again and hope you have a fantastic day. Happy investing. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of our Live and Invest Overseas podcast. For more, please visit liveandinvestoverseas.com slash podcast where you'll find lots more information and resources to help you live better and retire well overseas.